What's going on, guys? You're listening to WSOU. I am Nick, and I'm here with Jason from Death Therapy. What's going on, dude? Hey, man. It's awesome to talk to you. Of course, of course. You got a lot of cool stuff going on. This is a really interesting project, and uh, I definitely want to know more about it. So in the past, uh, I'd say, well, you have the, the, the official debut album is coming out, but you have you know, played live shows with this uh, this project, and you put out a song. Uh, what was the first one? It was in 2015, right? Uh, well, I put out a demo uh, like EP in 2015, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, long story short, it's a band that has been around since, like, you know, mid to late 2015 as a, you know, sort of, you know, being around locally and going up and playing a few shows here and there. Uh, did, did some tours in uh, 2016, played some festivals, and then I uh, got a record deal um, to do the full-length record, which is really exciting, with Solid State Records, and, uh, yeah, it comes out on the 24th. Definitely. So. And now tell me a little bit of background because it, it's not, you know, your your orthodox project. You're playing bass and you have loops and you're doing live drums and then vocals, obviously. Right. So, yeah, it's um, it's a two-man project uh, live. Like when we play live, it's just two of us. Um, so, you know, the nuts and bolts of it um, in the studio is that it's basically a solo project. It's... Um, it's sort of like, you know, I mean, that's not uncommon in industrial kind of music. For right. It to be, you know, sort of one guy who's writing the stuff and, um, you know, and he programs and he records and all this other kind of thing. So it's, it's, you know, it's kind of par for the course for industrial. But for metal, for metal bands, it's like unheard of. You know, your metal band, where's your guitar player? You don't have, you can't be a metal band with no guitar player. Right. Um, so this is, you know, it's a, sort of an industrial metal hybrid um with you know with the loops and stuff we're not probably we're not purist industrial enough for some of those people out there they're like you know way into the industrial um but we're not you know we're not like death metal i, I used to be in a in a straight technical death metal right. band called becoming the archetype back in the day so it's a big change um for that yeah so it's just just all bass drums and you know synthy kind of stuff for sure. And now, like uh, I read, you know, with Becoming the Archetype, everything was, was very intricate, complex, all packed together. And I, I read that with this project, you wanted to kind of open it up more about the feel and, and, and yeah. kind of get away from the, the complex, having everything all, you know, jumbled together. Yeah, I mean, um, so, so I, I think I think a lot of people who get into heavy music, they go through these phases in their life and and I think if you really dig in, at least into the subcultures of, of heavy technical, you know, metal music, I went through that phase where if it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't 300 BPM and it wasn't just the guitar players weren't shredding their faces off the whole time, I wasn't interested. Right. Um, you know, it had to be super technical. It had to, like, blow my, you know, blow my mind or I wasn't interested. Um, and then I've gotten older and, you know, kind of come back almost to my roots, which is like, you know, I think for most of us, if we really are honest with ourselves, our roots were like... Well, what kind of music were we listening to when we were like senior in high school, you know? Um, and for me, that was like Rage Against the Machine, uh, Marilyn Manson, Nine Inch Nails, Rob Zombie, that kind of stuff. Right. Just, you know, real straightforward, you know, four on the floor, groovy, but heavy um, kind of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, so, I mean, for me, it was kind of like with Becoming Archetype, we were really into the whole, like, let's write a 10-minute long song with, you know, 10... 10 time signature changes and all this other kind of stuff with this. It was more like, let's just pick a tempo and groove, you know, and, and find a cool lick and see what happens. Yeah. And I definitely, definitely like that, that you have the, the open mind to, to switch it up. And like you said, I do definitely see that in every, every kind of metal there, you know, you have your, the people that they, they gravitate to certain things and over time they'll switch back and forth. And now what kind of combined, because like you said, there is that industrial side, but at the same time, you know, there is that very heavy side with the, the vocals and you, you bring a little bit more than what industrial already had. You kind of almost combine like what you were doing with, you know, the industrial side. Yeah. I mean, so, um, you know, some people who've been listed, like the, the first single uh, for this kind of got introduced to the world, I guess, uh, like a month ago. Yeah. So it's pretty new. It's pretty new out there. Um, and people's responses have been things like, Oh, this is like if, you know, Nine Inch Nails was a metal band, uh, or, you know, was a death metal band, or if, um, you know, just it's heavier than Marilyn Manson. But, you know, so it's, you know, for me, I just, 
like we were talking about, I kind of took the approach of like, I'm just going to do what comes natural, see what comes out. Um, so with Becoming the Archetype, I never did any, any kind of clean vocals at all. It was all screaming, all growling, right. you know, traditional death metal kind of stuff. Um, with this one, it's, you know, there's some, there's some screaming stuff that kind of comes natural to me. I think people that have followed my music, you know, expect me to do that. Um, but there's some other stuff too. There's some singing, there's some more traditional industrial kind of stuff going on. But then, uh, yeah, I mean, I just kind of, I just kind of turned it on this time and just saw what came out and tried not to, uh, try not to overanalyze it too much and just, just let, I don't know, sort of, you know what I mean? Like instead of analyzing it with my head, just sort of letting it be like, does that feel good? Yeah, that feels good. Okay, let's, yeah. let's go with that, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I'm hoping people will resonate with that as they listen to it. Cause at the end of the day, I mean, you know, the vast majority of, of people are just trying to listen to what makes them feel good, you know, and what they like to hear. So, right. And now the album actually comes out this week. Uh, so what what kind of expectations do you have for how it's going to go over? Since you've only had, you know, that one song, there's definitely that curiosity factor that a lot of people have. And, you know, they want to see what this is going to be about. I got to hear the whole thing. And it, it's it's definitely really interesting. I really dig it. I definitely can see, you know, all the things that you're saying. They definitely ap uh, apply to the record itself. And it, it definitely has really cool vibes going on. Yeah, I mean... Uh -huh. So, so I think, you know, we've got another song, I think, coming out this week, like a single. Mm -hmm. um, and But I'm, I'm with you on, I, I definitely am curious to see what people's thoughts are going to be because you, as somebody who's heard it, I mean, the first track on the record is not like the second track on the nope. record. The yeah. last track on the record is not like any other track on the record. Like, the, it's a 10-song it's a record, but I feel like it kind of, it covers a lot of bases. It could be like three separate EPs almost. Oh yeah. Um, if you group the songs together, um, thematically. So that is, that is still like a little bit of my bringing my progressive metal, you know, background into it. Um, I, I would, I would put, I put it this way before to other people. There's sort of like, there's progressive metal and progressive rock that like, you know, blows your mind. And then there's progressive rock that like, they don't blow your mind, but they do these like subtle things that like, you know, you're like, wow, that's different. I can't find, why would they do that? So like, you know, being like Dream Theater, you know, everybody knows those guys can play. Yeah. They're super technical. Everybody wants, you know, John Petrucci is amazing guitar. But then there's a band like Muse. Well, they're on the radio. Muse is like a super popular band. Right. But then they'll, they'll, they'll end their record with like an orchestra song or something, you know? Yeah, it's true. Uh, and it's like, I think I fall a little bit into that category, you know, um, with this record. Okay. My old band was more like a shred your face off kind of band. Yeah. This band is more like a, Hey, you know, it's pretty groovy, but the last track on the record is this like, you know, crazy, like, you know, industrial Nintendo kind of like, um, you know, ode to classic video games. You know what I mean? It's like, um, it's all over the place. So I'm hoping that when people get a chance to listen to the whole thing, they'll really um, soak it all in and appreciate what's there. Definitely. And I know with this project, it was kind of inspired actually by Devin Townsend. Oh, yeah, for sure. I got to record with Devin was becoming the archetype in 2008 and there's no way i can overstate the influence that he had on me he's, he's a he's an out, outstanding musician you know great human being really creative mind i mean just to be just to be in the room with him as he's kind of working producing music like he's 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 unreal oh so, yeah i mean and every everything he does everything he touches is awesome um so so yeah i mean it, for me it was one of those things where he had he had some songs he wrote back pretty close to when we recorded with him and we were in the studio when he was sort of hashing them out and they were like these really dark but like groovy little simple songs and um and i was like man it'd be so cool since i'm a bass player i was like it's so cool to just have a band that was like dark groovy and heavy you know just bass line kind of thing you know yeah. there's, there's only one there's only one riff going on at the at a, at a, at a time and it, you know um, it's sort of like you gotta you gotta find that little groove and just and and make it work. And so I've talked to people about this. It's like it's been fun, but it's also been challenging. You know, yeah. when you when you when it's just bass, it's like well, you can't cover it up with a you know a cool solo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, for sure. Does that bass riff suck? Okay, well then I guess we can't do that. Um, so. <laughs> now, yeah. did he have any part on the actual album, or he was just the the big influence to, to work no, on this project? Yeah, no, um, no, I, you know, I haven't really got to talk to him or anything since 2008 when we recorded with him. But 
I, I guess what I'd say is, like I said before, just ever since then, I've kind of looked, you know, kind of followed what he's doing. And um, I just, I think he's, he, you know, not to plug him too much, obviously, but he's, I think he's the, he's one of the great underrated musicians of our time. I mean, he's, he's done every, every style out there and he's done it well. Um, and I think the fact that he's been in the more extreme genres of music, you know, is why a lot of people don't know about how talented he is. But, um, but yeah, he can do it all, so. Definitely. And now, like you said, it, it was challenging to, to kind of write because you can't really cover anything up. Now, in the live setting, how do you go about performing? And is that kind of nerve-wracking for you to just be you and one other person up there in front of people who, who like you said, you know, it's the curiosity factor. You don't know if people are going to dig it or not. Yeah, um, I, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to be the, you know, to get up on stage with just two guys and uh, in um, – and see see their faces when we kind of start out and um i mean i use a i use some effects and stuff obviously um so that it doesn't i mean it sounds like a bass but it sounds like a really big kind of distorted gritty nasty kind of bass right um so it sounds a little bigger than they're expecting first you know they just see a bass player and a drummer they're thinking okay when the other guy's gonna get up there on stage um but that's kind of fun you know they it catches them by surprise um which is weird because it's not like it's new. I mean, for there to be like a two-man rock band, yeah, no. the, white, the White Stripes uh, were doing it, um, and it was it became a big deal. Yeah. And you know, there's a band called Royal Blood that's pretty popular right now that does it. And um, you know, there's a, a friend of mine that we got the tour with back in the day. His name's Josh Scoggin. Oh in a band yeah, called 68. It's insane. I just saw them the other week, actually. Yeah, I mean, and it, so it's. You know, from the from an artist perspective, from my side of the table, I'm looking at it and going like, "Man, I hope everybody doesn't think I'm trying to copy '68 or trying to copy, you know, the White Stripes or right. you know whoever whoever else." But then we get up on stage and people are like, "Oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. It's so unique and so weird," you know. And I'm like, "Well, okay, cool. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's fun. it's just, I guess what I'm saying is it's funny how people take stuff differently than you'd expect. Right? Um, you know, we put out a single. And all these people are like, oh, my gosh, it sounds like he's ripping off Marilyn Manson. And I'm thinking, I wasn't even thinking about Marilyn Manson. I wrote that. Uh, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, anyway. Now, do you – how do you do it? Do you do live loops or do you backtrack some stuff? We uh, – so we, we have – we play with the MIDI kind of stuff, like the little, like, you know, synthy keyboard stuff on, on a backtrack. Okay. Um, but then – the sound like I play through a guitar cab and a bass cab and I'm playing that simultaneously. It's it's just basically the way I set up my pedal board with two different chains. Um similar to something like Josh in sixty eight does. Um it's just sort of the you know, flip flop of that. Right. Um because I'm doing the bass and I'm boosting a sound, you know, up to sound a little more like a guitar. It doesn't it really doesn't sound like a guitar, but um but yeah, it makes it a little fuller, a little heavier and um you know, there's a lot of synth stuff on the record, um, but for the most part, it, it's not really like overwhelming, like synth in your face. Like, you know, there's a Jordan Rudis guitar or you know synth solo. It's mostly just kind of moody stuff. You know, little little loopy things. Right. When I was in when I was in becoming the archetype, you know, in the early 2000s, we were like very purist. Like, if you know, if we can't recreate exactly what it does on the record then we can't put it on the record right um it's 2017 now the it's world is different has, the world has changed you know like every band that every local band that shows up now is like okay let's check our backing tracks you know yeah. um and it's you know back like i say back in the early 2000s i would have been like oh come on what do you think of backing <laughs> tracks um so you know but uh yeah it works and um and uh, and yeah, I don't I don't uh, I don't think too much about it. It just kind of seems natural to me at this point. Yeah, okay. uh, what we're doing. And like that kind of actually it actually ties into what's going on right now. With uh, speaking of backing tracks, is I don't know if you've seen, but the the Browning were in tour in right, Italy, right. and they lost you know their all their laptops got stolen with has all their you know their files and yeah, and they oh said we God. literally cannot play. And a lot of people were like, well that that's kind of ridiculous if if I can't go to your show without your laptop, you know, like the, the fact that your whole show is basically your laptop. So what, you know, like you said, your, your view has kind of changed on that. Well, a little bit. I mean, and okay. So I think it depends on how you're coming at it because and I'm coming at it from an industrial sort of bit, right. you know it's what I mean? Different. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a tradition that goes back, you know, 20, 30 years of industrial 
bands that are literally just one dude who stands up there right. with a computer or a keyboard. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? So what I'm doing is actually a whole lot more organic than that. I've, I've got two live acoustic instruments up on stage. Right. Um, we play with some. We played uh, with some some uh, industrial bands here in Atlanta recently, and it was just kind of like, you know, we're the only band with a drummer up on stage. Everybody else has just got, you know, loops playing through the through the um, through the system. So I would say on that side, I don't feel so weird about it. But also, we um, we're not necessarily doing the like um, as much intricate stuff as some of those guys are doing. I, like I can imagine that part of the reason they can't do what they're doing is they probably run through their computer. They're probably running like amped tracks right. that come out and they play through the cabs and and they're running the amp stuff that's like stereo through through the these interfaces. Ours is much more simple because it's just it's it's just like MIDI stuff. So we're basically just running tracks that you know that kind of back us up. If they were to cut off, we'll keep playing. Um, if my laptop were to get stolen, I get another laptop and download them from the from the cloud <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. uh, i'm not trying to say we've got it better yeah um what i'm saying is we don't really rely on it that much but then you know let me flip it to the other side i mean e- this edm movement is huge right now there's people oh, yeah. going there's people going you know 60 70 thousand people going to watch one guy up there with his laptop true and i mean we can make fun of that but like it people like it like i said you know i mean people ultimately are you know most people are not as analytical as I am about music. Most people just listen to what they think sounds good. So if uh, if the band gets up on stage and it sounds good, they don't, you know, as long as they're not like Millie Vanilli and, you know, <laughs> so, right. or Mariah Carey, uh, <laughs> whatever. Now, I wanted to talk about, too, uh, the, I don't know if it was, you know, intentional, but there is definitely a big, I know it's in the, the band title itself, but there is a big, um, theme of death on the album it's in you know the just the word dead or death is in three of the song titles the right you know the name of the band itself and i feel like the even the album title could tie in a little bit but is that something that you did intentional or is it like kind of a running theme you wanted to to get across yeah i mean so 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 the record the band everything that has to do with this project uh was kind of born out of um my own struggles um, as a person and needing to have an outlet to to voice those things. Um, when I left the previous band, it was about six years, five years almost, till I wrote anything else for this. Okay. Um, so there was a, like a long period. And in that time, uh, I had kids and, you know, dealt with the whole, like, you know, let's, let's be a responsible adult and get a real job kind of thing. You know what I mean? As opposed to being 20 years old like we were when we signed a record deal and touring around traveling the world um okay real life and so this was a very real record and for me to just sort of like open up and be like hey let's um let's talk about some of the dark parts of what's going on in life um the depression the struggles but the death therapy is the name not just death you know not, right not, but but like it sort of so it sort of harkens to like the the therapeutic nature of putting it out all, all out on the table and being like, here's, you know, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm struggling with, but it's okay. Like we can talk about it. Like we don't have to hide it. We don't have to like sugarcoat it. We don't have to be like, no, nah, no, nah, man, everything's good. Um, you know, in order to be, um, oh, and we don't have to go the opposite way. We don't have to be like, you know, gloom and doom metal band. It's just, it's all, there's no hope. Everything's just dark and, and awful. And, you know, so it's kind of like, I, I mean, I guess, I guess I feel like the the storm before the calm is the title of the record. The death therapy is the name of the band. Like you said, there's wake me when I'm dead. There's um, slow dance with death. You know, these are songs that really had a lot to do with just sort of my own um, struggles and coming to a place of like, you know, needing, needing, you know what I mean, like needing needing an outlet right. for that so that I could express it. And, um, like I said, the one song, Slow Dance with Death, I mean, it's just a song that literally riding in my car, sitting down, had this idea of like, man, I'm tired. I'm tired of just surviving. Like just, I need something else. And that's the the main lyric of the song is I'm tired of just surviving, slow dancing with death every day of my life. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's really where this record's coming from. So now just real quick, death therapy 
the name of the band is also, there's also a funny side to that or like okay. a superficial side to that. There's an old Bill Murray movie called What About Bob? Um, and people who are, people who are not over 30 probably will not be aware that that movie exists. But, <laughs> that would but be Bill, me. Bill Murray is awesome and it's a great movie and they should go back and watch it it's on Netflix, I think now. Okay. And anyway, there's a pivotal scene in the movie, um, where the term death therapy is used pretty funny. And okay. uh, so when I was watching it I, I, three years ago or whatever, I was like, God, there needs to be a death metal band called Death Therapy. Like, that's a no-brainer. Um, and so I decided I would fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like that. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about because I wanted to hear a little bit more about it is yeah. you are – I don't know if you still do, but I, I've read that you were working with RYFO – which yeah. helps musicians, you know, find places to stay when they're on the road and stuff and, and food. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I feel like that's something that, especially now with like, you see literally this past week, three bands got robbed. Like, Oh my gosh. You yeah. know, I, obviously I'm sure this is something that, you know, you try to help work on, but I feel like that, you know, musicians are, are kind of that, you know, everything it, it's not DIY necessarily because, you know, there's labels and whatnot, but at the end of the day, the band is the band, you know, they're the ones out traveling and, you know, they're the ones putting, you know, money up for food and travel right. and putting themselves in these situations. And, you know, this is those the kind of organization that kind of, you know, kind of helps with that. Right. And people think, people think, oh, well, this band, you know, let's just use an example. You use the Browning Fit for a King who are the same record label. Yeah. Uh, as us, I just saw that they they got robbed yeah. um, right before they're leaving for a tour yeah. with Amur Amur and those. Yeah. So people think, oh, you know, they're on a record label. It's just, just the record label will give them some money. They'll be fine. But the deal is, like, that's not how it works. Right? Like, yeah, they could probably call up the record label or they could call up somebody and ask for some money. But like, that's just money that's going to come out of their own pockets later. Oh, yeah. Um. It does. It isn't just like there's a money pit. Um. That they can go get it from. So it's it's tough and. Um, you know, part of the part of the struggle is those guys. I mean, five, six guys in the band, and all this merch and all this gear. I mean, they're. I mean, I think the the one for Fit for Kings had ten thousand dollars. Yeah, more like their gear. amps and stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh, like that's crazy. Um, so yeah, I used to work for a group called Rifo, and our band is still part of Rifo. Okay. Um, basically, Rifo is a network that exists to help bands out that are traveling. So a lot of indie bands, they're not necessarily all metal bands. A lot of them are indie rock bands. There's some, there's even some like radio kind of contemporary bands and stuff that are, that are, that work through it. There's a bluegrass band. I know that's in rifle. I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of bands, hundreds of bands, and um, they have a network of people all around the country who open their homes. Um, you know, so it's not something that like, you know, Keith Urban, uh, <laughs> doesn't need a place to stay <laughs> right. when he's on tour. Um, but, death therapy does and we don't typically get to play venues where they you know going to pay us enough or give us a hotel comp or something like that so it's huge number one um, financially number two it's huge relationally because anybody who's ever toured consistently um and i can speak from my own experience anybody who's ever toured cons consistently knows that the relationships that you miss are hard like People think, oh, you're on the road. I mean, everybody loves you. You're playing on stage. I mean, oh, wow, you know. But being on the road can be extremely lonely yeah. existence because you're only on the stage for like an hour of the 24 hours, and you're driving most of the time, and you got these, you know, other people in the van that you're probably sick of seeing by the, like the third week of tour. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's like, what, what, you know, where are we going to eat now? Okay, we're going to eat at another Waffle House or whatever. So to, to like have – have these sort of people that you look forward to. Hey, we're going to Indianapolis. We're going to stay with this family. Oh, cool. I can't wait to see them. They always make us this, you know, food or whatever, you know, kind oh, of cool. thing. Um, super cool. Yeah. So, and then, uh, so it's rifo.org, ryfo.org. And bands can sign up for free. It's not like you don't get, it's not charge anything. And um, that, that's really all there is to it. Now, they do have other things, like they have a, um, like a Facebook page where people can post, like, emergencies like hey this band got broken into here's the link to help them out and um sort of sort of a platform uh for that and sometimes sometimes there's people in the area like let's say a band um you know 
had a massive breakdown or got in a wreck and they needed a ride. Sometimes there's people in the network who are in the area who can help them out. So the main thing they do is the host home uh, host home deal, but there's other stuff that they do. So, yeah, I think it's great. Um, I think if people understood how important it is to preserving the indie music scene, they would be they'd be more interested in donating because it is a nonprofit organization. They take right. donations and stuff. Um, but it's, it's hard to sell people on the idea of donating to, you know, a nonprofit that helps musicians because people just think, Oh, whatever, you know, they're, they're rock stars. What do they do what they want? You know, it's like, no, like most of your favorite bands that are out there in the indie music scene are like, they're just hoping they have enough money for gas. You yeah. know, like <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're not out there just raking in the money and, and, uh, live in large. So, um, anyway. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I definitely think that that's something that we definitely need more of. And I, it's it's one of those things because music isn't one of those, you know, kind of industries where there is like a union or something where every, I mean, in a way, everyone kind of has each other's back in a certain aspect. But again, right. you know, you're the ones that take all the hits on the road and there's, you know, not right. necessarily a lot of people that, that can help you out. So I definitely support something like that. And I feel like, you know, that's something that we need a lot more of. Yeah, and if you, I mean, folks on the East Coast, I mean, is especially where they, they need, you know, they need help. So if folks on the East Coast listen to your program, I mean, yeah. that, that, it'd be really worth looking at. Cause basically, if you're a band, you can go look, rifo.org, go look it up if you're a band and sign up. But if you're, say, a person that's like, oh, hey, you know, we, we've got an extra, you know, we got a basement and like, we love band. Um, you can go sign up and, and, you know, help people out kind of thing. So, um, it's great. Definitely. Now that's all I got for you. Have anything you want to add wrapping up? Uh, I'm waiting. Mean, just, just I'm excited about the record coming out. Um, it feels like you know, it felt like it was never gonna get here, and now it's here. It feels like it's going so fast. So the 24th, it comes out. We're hitting the road. Um, on that day, we're gonna be playing some CD release shows: Chattanooga, right. Atlanta, Ohio. Um, gonna be up in uh, up in the Northeast, hopefully later in the summer, and. Um, yeah, I mean, excited about it coming out, and I hope people who are listening to this will give it give it a shot, listen to it. Um, it's on, you know, everywhere, iTunes, everything. And understanding that, you know, I'm sure they've heard this a million times, but, you know, support indie music. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's uh, the, the music world has changed, and people don't buy music anymore. So <laughs> right. check it out, support yeah. it, you know, help us out. We want to do this stuff. So. For sure. Awesome. Well, I really do appreciate yeah. your time. I had a great time talking with you. Yeah. Same here. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. No problem.